will never pass away. Oh, you've got some changing path. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, bear and bright the home in glory, your enraptured soul will be. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Unchanging hand, build your thoughts on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Please be seated. Our hymn of invitation, I bring my sins to thee, number 262. 262. Well, finally, we get to come up for some air. <coughs> now that the, the uh, presidential election cycle is over, but don't get too used to it. The midterms are coming up here shortly. I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, what we just went through is arguably the most bitter presidential campaign that we've seen, uh, at least for me. And like a lot of people, I was troubled by the division that I saw and the downright foul and vicious uh, attacks. And I'm not talking just among the candidates. I expect that. But I'm talking about supporters of the candidates, especially on social media. Now it's been said that history repeats itself, and you'll probably recognize some of these uh, names as kind of a hit parade of empires and countries that don't exist anymore. Uh, and you notice the United States is on this list. I do not want it to end up uh, a fallen uh, pile of rubble empire like, uh, say, Rome is today, or like Sodom, or Babylon, or any one of these uh, empires that have gone by the wayside. Turkey, remember, was the Ottoman Empire uh, back uh, until the end of World War I, and then it, too, is basically a third world country now. I really hope that our nation doesn't go down that road, but it can, because History does repeat itself. I'm a student of history. I've taught it kind of an amateur historian. And the thing that I have never understood is why people don't learn from the mistakes of the past. That we look, we, we, we look at things that have happened in, in countries before us and think, oh, it won't happen to us. We, don't, we look at Rome, look at Greece, look at all these empires, we, and we see the same things happening. Oh, it's okay for us to redefine marriage and make uh, homosexuality, things like that, acceptable. It's fine. You know, every single one of these accepted it eventually, always on the downward uh, 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 slide. So if all those things happen to them on the downward slide, if they fell, what makes us think we, we aren't going to go to hell? Because it, it can happen. In, in, in the Old Testament, we're going to look at Second Chronicles chapter 7, and I want us to make application to us here today. But I want to point something else out before we get into that. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Ahab, the king of Israel, meets Elijah by asking him in verse 17, Is that you, O oh, you troubler of Israel? Now, Elijah really wasn't troubling Israel. He was just telling them the truth, and they thought it was trouble. To trouble someone means to agitate or to, to uh, uh, bother or to disturb to afflict with pain or discomfort, to cause mental uh, agitation or distress. And faithful servants of God are oftentimes regarded as troublemakers. Why? Because our friends and neighbors want to just believe I'm living a good life and I, that's what's going to get me to heaven. And then we come along and say, well, no, that's not going to work. Or they, they say making these kinds of changes in society like we see going on around us is all positive, it's a good thing. And then they have to be told, oh, wait a minute, no, it's not, because God's word says something the opposite. 
and then we get looked upon as, as being the troublemakers. You see, the, the thing you have to understand, is truth does not cause the problem. What causes the problem is when we want to reject the truth. And that can be scriptural truth, spiritual truth, whether it's science, whether it's medicine. Uh, when you reject truth, that's going to get you into trouble. In the Old Testament, Elijah called the nation of Israel back to God. And that is what needs to happen today. We need to be calling people back to God. Now, on January the 20th, Donald Trump will take the oath of office as our 45th president. The, the problems are not going to be solved in Washington or in Montgomery or Atlanta or uh, Ottawa or Mexico City or London or Paris or any other world capital. The problems that we are facing are spiritual in nature. They are problems that we need to combat and to face uh, on our knees in prayer before God. If you have your Bibles, look at Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And actually, Ronald Reagan had his Bible open to this passage when he took the oath of office, I know for the second time. But if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven and will hear, heal their land. Now, we need to keep this in mind for our daily prayer session. And notice I say daily, because you can't rely on just praying here on, on Sundays for a few minutes or on Wednesdays for a few minutes to do the, the job that really needs to be done. Any more than you can uh, eat one meal today and expect to carry you through the rest of the week or longer. We've got to be making sure we are uh, yeah, people of prayer, and that's where it's going to come back to helping to solve our nation and heal our land. Let's look here, first of all, at God's people. Because in the Old Testament, of course, the Jews were God's people. Abraham, remember, was told to get out of his land and, and uh, to go to a place that God would eventually tell him in Genesis chapter 12. And then in Exodus, uh, we see that it was fulfilled. They came into the promised land. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 8 fulfilled, uh, uh, says it was fulfilled. And then today, that's going to make us, the Christians, to be God's people because of the promise of the covenant. Here's where the promise was made in Jeremiah 31. Hebrews 8 says it was fulfilled that, uh, that the new covenant came. We are no longer under the old covenant. So we see that uh, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And it is uh, today that the Christians, we are the representatives of God. We are the ones that need to be the light uh, in the darkness. We are the ones that need to be leading people to Christ. And if we're not going to do it, who's going to? They just tell you, there isn't anybody else who can do it. So uh, let's be the light that we need to be now. God's people, you notice in 2 Chronicles 7, we need to humble ourselves. And if you can see the cartoon here, it tells you that humility isn't thinking <coughs> less of yourself. And this, this character is saying, oh, everyone uh, is better than me, no one likes me. It's really thinking of yourself less, like he's doing here. He's helping this person here. That's really what humility is. It's not, it's not uh, bad self-esteem or thinking of others as better than you. It's just simply putting needs of others ahead of your own. It's just thinking of others, really, is what it is. Humble means to have the low opinion of one's importance or merits. That's what it is. Uh, it's uh, not being real proud or haughty. It is, it, the Hebrew word means to bring in the subjection. When you look at it here in the Second Chronicles 7, it means to bring in the subjection uh, to, uh, to somebody or to something, something that is a higher uh, authority or a higher, higher position. And God will not send revival. He will not heal our land until such time as uh, we humble ourselves before God. And we can, because God cannot fill, uh, uh, his, uh, fill, his, put, fill, put anything in us, his spirit or anything, unless we are humble about it. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33, you're going to see an example there of someone, Manasseh, who, uh, who became king, and then it was said he did evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, it was so bad he was worse than all the kings before him. How would you like to have that uh, as, as uh, the way to remember you, as your moniker, that you became king or you became ruler and you were worse than everybody before you? And when you consider the competition that Manasseh had to be worse than the kings before him, that's saying a lot. But look at 2 Chronicles 33. When he was in affliction, he was in Manasseh. He implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him and he received his entreaty 
heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom, then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So God settled the question once and for all about authority. This was the time when Babylonians came and took him away and uh, literally put a hook through his nose. And we've got to humble ourselves before God in order that he will hear and respond to the things that, uh, that we ask. God doesn't break the promises. It's when we break them. We need to realize that God puts the responsibility, though, to humble ourselves on us. It is up to us to decide whether to be humble uh, before God or we can be proud, we can be haughty. Remember, we are told to uh, not uh, uh, be proud because God gives grace to the humble. But we are told here to intentionally humble ourselves. He doesn't tell us to, to feel humble or to, to just act humbly, but to intentionally humble. Zephaniah uh, chapter 2, he says to seek humility. So what does it mean then to seek humility? You know, a lot of times we, we get humbled a little bit. Maybe somebody will, will tell us or give us a compliment. We'll say, oh, well, thank you, you know, for your kind words. It can be, you know, kind of humble. Yeah, it's a nice suit. Oh, well, well thank you. You did a good job. Well, hang on. Thank you. Now we let it go at that. As opposed to a boss that my dad had. His company got sold. I was about 13 or 14 at the time. And he brought the new boss home. He's going to fix dinner and... And uh, I, I didn't know the man when he walked in the house, and he was in a business suit. And I just said, "Hey, it's a, that's a nice suit you're wearing." And he just, I remember he just kind of turned. He had a drink in his hand, and he just took a sip, and he says, "Well, to be professional, you got to look professional." There's a reason why I think he didn't really last in business very long. He had a very haughty, uh, high attitude of himself, versus someone who was very uh, uh, humble about things. Maybe even getting. Uh, elevated to a high position, they realize it, that it's a lot of work there, and they realize they need uh, people to help them, they need God, they need whoever it is to help them. In Matthew chapter 18, we're even told there to become like a child. Now you think about what a child is like. He said, if you want to become great in the kingdom of heaven, then become like this, uh, this little child, uh, these little children. Now think about, too, what was going on there. When uh, uh, the disciples are fussing over who's going to be the most important, Look at chapter 19. They are still at it. And then in chapter 20 is when James and John's mother comes and says, Hey, Lord, I have a favor of you. Okay, what is it? Well, I want uh, when, in your kingdom for one, one of my sons to be on the right hand and one on the left. Wow. A little bit hot in there, isn't it? This is like calling, uh, say, the new president, the incoming president. And, and now, hey, I want to be, uh, have a position here. Kevin, I want to be Secretary of State or Secretary of one of the high profile, uh, considered more prestigious uh, positions. And Jesus then put them in their place. But that is not fine to give them one. Number two is uh, to have some humility. When you go to a bank, we'll take the, the low seat. And then if you're told to move up to the high seat, you're not going to be embarrassed. Where, uh, as if you go the other way around, it's going to be embarrassing. They were allowing themselves to be controlled by that human nature. It says, i got to be number one. i got to look out for number one. And in many ways, uh, uh, believers in our day and time are just like them. You know, things haven't really changed. Nothing wrong with taking care of yourself, taking care of your family. But when you get to that point where you can't be humble and be appreciative of compliments, when you get to where you've got to be in the number one place all the time, out front, something's not right with your attitude. In fact, in Matthew 23, you can see how the religious leaders there thought they were just a step closer to God because uh, that's why they get the bragging rights. And sometimes I think because we, we in our culture today and actually for a long time have looked at um, the clergy, so-called clergy lady, we tend to think that because someone has the title bishop or pope or pastor or whichever one you want, that they are somehow uh, way up here closer to God than, than we are way down here. And that shouldn't be looked at that way, not on that kind of a level, on that kind of a pedestal. The Pharisees thought they were closer to God. Uh, God, I thank you that I'm not like the sinner over there. You know, I, I give them uh, a tithe uh, and I fast and I do this and I do that. That's haughtiness. Versus someone who just goes and, and does it and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Do you think, let me ask you this, do you think God is really going to be all that impressed with, with our service? Man, do you think God is impressed with, uh, with Donald Trump's money or Warren Buffett's money? I doubt it. 
I mean, they could pile all their assets together and still not enough there to buy sell. I got them saying, uh huh. And that's what's going to impress me. Probably about like how my bank account wouldn't really impress a Donald Trump or a Warren Buffett very much. Probably more their change jar than I've got in my bank account. But it's, it's like, you know, God's going to say, yes, yeah, so what? I created the whole universe. You expect that to impress me? It's not going to impress him. That, that, that song Shania Twain did years ago, that don't impress me much. It's just not going to be impressive at all uh, to God. He has every hair in our head counted, remember. So it's not going to impress him. James chapter 4, humble ourselves, uh, means to recognize that our word comes from God alone. God created us. God made us in his image. No other animal, no other creature is in the image of God. So we've got to look at the fact that we are in his image. That uh, it is recognizing our need for God. That's what humility is. My need uh, for him. Just like a child. You know, children are completely dependent on their parents. And, and yeah, my three-year-old's getting to where she's a little more independent now. She likes to open the refrigerator. She'll get things out of it. And uh, now even little things she likes to do, if we're having breakfast, she wants to pull the cap off the milk. No, Daddy, I do it. You know, she wants to put it back on. She's showing herself to be very independent. But she still has to ask for help. And there's a lot of things she can't do yet. Um, so as, as adults, we've got to remember, we sometimes have to ask for help. And sometimes it's uh, from another human. Sometimes I've got to uh, take it to the Lord. Now, for our national survival, we've got to remember to pray and to seek God. Let me ask you this again. If we're not praying, who is? I don't know too many atheists who pray. Now, maybe a few agnostics might pray to whatever their conception of God is. But it's, it's going to be up to us to pray and to really seek God, to get ourselves back to God. And you cannot seek God if you are not praying. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, where Jesus went for the, uh, the, the, just before he selected the apostles. How long does it say there he prayed? Did he just do a quick, oh, Lord, I got to go pick these, uh, or Father, I got to go pick these apostles and uh, uh, be with me, Lord, God, guard, direct me, boom, and head out to go pick his apostles. He prayed all night. An extended period of time. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to pray all night or pray for it or gone into your uh, private uh, closet or room and just prayed and prayed and been there for an hour, two hours, three. I don't know if you've ever done that or not. But just like praying all night. I don't know if you went for eight or ten hours straight. Maybe he napped a little bit. Maybe he stopped and sang a song or two. I don't know how exactly he, the mechanics of it work, the logistics of it work. But he didn't do just a quick uh, uh, canned prayer and then go out and pick the possible. That was probably one of the most important things, decisions he had to make, important with the possible. Because remember, they're going to be his representative. There is no plan B. They're the ones that are going to go out and do the preaching when he's gone. Because Jesus, remember, knew he wasn't going to be here uh, forever. So he had to make some pretty heavy decisions there. Rick Warren, who wrote the book, uh, The Purpose Driven Church, made a couple of notes about prayer and the time that we spend in prayer. Number one is prayer changes us. Sometimes we open ourselves up to God. In fact, years ago, I had a friend of mine tell me that uh, the thing about he and his wife praying together was that you'll say things in those prayers a lot of times you wouldn't say to your spouse in a normal conversation. And it can, it can bring up a lot of things sometimes. Or as you're praying for people or things... Uh, events and things like that, that it can bring up a lot of things uh, for you. So it will change us. And it can have uh, impact on people and on events. You remember back in uh, Kings where Hezekiah, God sent Isaiah to Hezekiah and told him, your time is up. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. And before Isaiah even got out the door, God said, Isaiah, go back to Hezekiah and tell him, I'm going to extend his life. So it can have an effect on people. Remember Moses holding up his hands uh, in battle. It has an effect there. It can have an effect on people, on places, on events. And then uh, another thing to remember is that it can help us during times of difficulty to remain strong, to stay focused, knowing that there is uh, a God in heaven who is hearing our prayers. It doesn't mean things are going to get easy. No. You know, sometimes uh, when, when hard times come, we just have to go through them. Not a whole lot we can do about it, but we can still uh, pray about it. And then for prayer to be effective, remember, we've got to believe that prayer is going uh, to work. 
You can't just uh, uh, go to God and just say, okay, we've done everything else, let's just do it. We need to have the right motive, and we need to believe that prayer works. It's great to pray for our needs, but here again, am I letting my pride get a hold of me when I want that brand new Chevy Suburban so I can show it off? Or when I want to buy this new house because it's a, 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 a 7,000, 10,000 square foot house with a swimming pool and all these extras with it. Or if I'm praying to God to give me the uh, help me have the highest score on the test at school so I can show up the guy sitting next to me who's always done better. It's, there's, there's problems with motives there. But I can still pray to God and believe, God, you're going to get me through this time. You're going to help me get a good grade on the test. You're going to help me uh, with my job situation, whatever it is. And we lay it out before God, and we believe God's going to work it out somehow to uh, the best. And then we also have to remember that we need to turn from our wicked ways for national survival. Now go back to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Remember, who's he talking to? If my people, who are called by my name, he's not talking about the pagans and the heathens around them. He's not talking, and today when we make application, we're not talking about the people that are out uh, fishing today who are out drinking and, and out uh, having tailgate parties for, uh, for football games today. We have to make sure that we clean the sin out of our lives. That's the whole uh, purpose of this part of it. Uh, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, First John 3, 4 tells us, and sin is lawlessness. Do we really believe that and take it seriously today? Uh, and I'm speaking to us as God's people. Or do we like to let a little bit of sin get in just enough maybe so that uh, it doesn't really bother our conscience, but at the same time I'm not bothering my friends around me, where I'm still able to have uh, my fun. See, secular people think of crime, war, drugs, things like that as being the problem. The problem, though, is sin. And the mentality, I'm afraid, has slipped into the church. Modern-day Christians are looking to secular man-made solutions to solve our problem. We're looking to Washington to spend some more money, give us more welfare, or more money on education. We're looking to Montgomery, the United Nations, where folks, let's look, let's look right here to solve the problems. <clears throat> Just throwing money at any problem isn't going to solve it. And that's especially true when you look at the fact that the uh, problems we're facing are spiritual in nature. So he says we need to turn from our wicked ways now, you might be the one who thinks, yeah, you know, I was baptized, and it was great. Maybe there were several of us baptized at camp, and it was a great uh, ceremony, a great time, and I take communion every week, so you know, that's not going to get you to the promised land, though. And you may be a member of the church, but you know that doesn't exempt you from God's judgment. A good beginning does not always guarantee a good finish or a good ending, although it can definitely help. Transgression is God it, uh, is a lawlessness, and really the Greek word hamartia means to miss the mark. And that's what happens when we sin. We have missed God's mark. Now, what is the mark? Well, God's, God's word gives us the mark. God gives us the standard. And, and what the target is that we need to shoot for, and lawlessness is just an act of rebellion. And this is where, see, God took the guesswork out. He gives us the proper standard. It is found in Scripture. We don't have to get, well, you know, I think it's thus and so it's a sin. Yeah, well, I think something else is. Oh, really? Well, I don't think that's so bad. I think that's okay. God takes the guesswork out. The man likes to complicate it. We like to take it and, and take it apart and say, well, you know, God didn't really mean what he said here in 1 Corinthians 6. And really over here, well, you know, we, we didn't, uh, that's not anything we need to worry about today. If God said it, that's the end of it. And remember, there's a difference between committing sin and continual sin. And we're all going to sin at times. The difference is in, in uh, say, uh, uh, you remember when it used to rain here? Uh, when you have a puddle on the ground and you go out, the pavement's wet or snow's on the ground, you slip, you fall in the mud. That's an accidental kind of sin. Versus when there's water out there and your kid sees it and runs out there and just plunges right into the puddle and you know, goes everywhere, messes up their good clothes. That was the look. He knew that puddle was there. He didn't have to go. In fact, you probably said, hey, stay out of that puddle. And that was like red flag to the bull. Boom, he's right in the puddle. Uh, that's what deliberate lifestyle choices that put us uh, in the sin are. It's jumping into the puddle. There's a difference between the two. And uh, one is really, one, you get up, you clean yourself off, you move on. The other one, 
probably going to have to go home, change clothes, have a bath. It's going to be a whole lot more uh, in-depth uh, uh, cleanup than just getting up and dusting yourself off. And remember Isaiah 59 tells us that sin is what comes between us and God. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. In the context of Isaiah 59, the people of Israel are really wondering, why is God not hearing us anymore? What, why is it that our prayers seem to be getting ignored? Why does it seem like God is not watching over us anymore? And Isaiah is saying, look, God can still save you. He can still hear you. The problem is your sins have separated it. It's on a cloudy day. The sun is still up there. We'll tell the sun didn't come out today. Yeah, it did, but the clouds hide it. Or if you're in the other room over there, I can't see you because that wall's in the way. That's the way sin becomes between us and God. And if you're in the other room over there, we're trying to talk to each other. You can't hear me. I can't hear you. So maybe I'll come down here by the door or I'll actually go into the room or you'll come out here and we can talk to each other. That's the way it is with God. Just think of sin as a wall or a layer of clouds between us where we can't see God and uh, uh, he's not going to hear uh, our prayers. And he's not gonna, going to uh, uh, respond to them. And uh, the, that uh, will be there between us. And they want to know why God didn't seem to hear their prayers. It's because of sinfulness. That's what separates us. And that's going to happen to our nation. So the solution, again, remember, is for God's people to come back and be serious about our commitment uh, to God. First Corinthians chapter 6, sin is specifically spelled out by God. You cannot have any kind of sin and evil in your life, like the kind that we're talking about where you're jumping into the mud puddle and... and uh, uh, be able to uh, grow in your relationship with God or be effective uh, for the Lord. And you look at uh, what was going on in Corinth, it got pretty bad there. And you could look around here, and arguably, in America, it's getting just as bad as what it was there uh, in Corinth. And we have to remember that God has three promises here. If we turn ourselves away from our wicked ways, we uh, uh, turn our face to him. We uh, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. Notice there are three promises here that he gives. Number one is God will hear. I will hear from heaven their prayer, he says. And I will forgive their iniquities. I will forgive their sin. They turn their backs on sin. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear. And then I will forgive. And then God says, and this is what will help benefit everybody, is I will heal the land. Now remember, it's not just God's people that live in the land. There's a lot of people around them. There's a lot of non-Christians around here. So how, how do you think that will benefit society if we as God's people do what he says to do here? Humble ourselves, pray, and seek his face. Remember, the rain comes on the dust and the unjust. The people around us will benefit. Someone once said years ago that if all the Christians live for just 24 hours as if we really believe the Bible, that the church buildings would be so full they couldn't hold everybody if we really showed people that it's real. Just, just give that some thought for a minute. If all of us just went out and did that. Say, starting... Uh, uh, it's almost noon, say so starting at noon today to noon tomorrow. We always live like we really believe in. What an uh, impact do you think that would have? And think about, too, when we're studying Russell and Shovel, the impact that Randall had on Michael and why he's a Christian. Now, look at that. See, and that's another thing I can tell us is the, the, the uh, say, the domino effect. Because of that one person who took the time to teach Michael, and now Michael has gone out with this book, and how many people have been converted and restored because of it? Remember, decisions never happen in a vacuum. You never know uh, who your decision to become a Christian will affect, or your decision uh, to be faithful will affect, or your decision to study with someone. How many people could be affected uh, by that decision? Because we need to pray for our nation. Because our problems now are so much more than just a lack of money or a lack of education. It's a lot deeper than that. In fact, I dare say that the problems of our nation won't be solved until we uh, turn ourselves back to the Lord, until we put uh, this, this uh, uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 7 into effect and pray and seek God's face. This week as we're going about and as we're drawing closer to the start of a new administration and a new year, 
Let's remember to really pray for our nation. Let's remember that our nation needs to look to the Lord to solve its problems. That simply turning to Washington and writing checks <coughs> and starting programs isn't going to take care of the problem until we address sin. And let it start here with us today. Let us start by humbling ourselves and turning back to the Lord. If we can help you at all with that today. To renew your commitment to the Lord, to walk closer to the Lord, why not let us know as together we stand and as we say, I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may to thee, in my once open power, I bring them, Savior, all to thee, the burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee, the grief I cannot tell. No word shall meet in thee, thou knowest all so well. I bring the sorrow laid on me, O suffering Savior, all to thee, O suffering Savior, all to thee. I bring, I bring to thee, I will not be my own, O Savior, let me be. I never lie alone, my heart, my life, my all I bring, to Thee, my Savior and my King, to Thee, my Savior and my King. Please be seated. It's time as we prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, we will sing. When my love to Christ grows weak, and the seven people do, the seven people do. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then 